Hello everyone and welcome to the Phantom Made Podcast. Today is a great episode. I have my good friend Kiara on. She is a delight. She knows what she's talking about. She has been on social media for a long time. Um, she has a lot of experience with different fandoms. Um, and today we have a very interesting topic on whether or not fanfiction is considered a serious art form. Um, we also talk about other things such as how much fandom participation is too much participation, and other things that kind of get a little off topic, but they are still interesting nonetheless. So make sure if you like the episode, leave a like or a comment to let me know. And without further ado, please enjoy the podcast. So yeah, thank you for doing this. Um, That's fine. Thank you for taking <laughs> taking a time out of your busy schedule. <laughs> yes, busy quotation mark. I do so much of your busy schedule to do to have this conversation with me. Um, <laughs> so why don't you? Well, I should have asked you this beforehand, but what do you what what do you want to introduce yourself as? Because obviously, oh. people people need to know that you kind of know what you're talking about. Because otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't have you. You know, I don't just drag somebody random off the street and tell them to <laughs> come talk about this with hey, me. Um, I don't know. What could I'm not really introducible, am I? Hi, I'm Kiara and I've had a couple viral posts. No, I don't know. <laughs> on I've the been internet. In... <laughs> and you've run yeah, you do you don't have to say your URL or anything, but you've you've run a couple of semi popular well, I don't know about a couple, I know you run a semi-popular Tumblr blog. Yeah, it's not as popular anymore. Um, I sort of like peaked a few years ago now. I've got like really inactive followers, but um, yeah, I've got a Tumblr blog that's been relatively popular over the years, I guess. And you're you're probably one of the more experienced internet, get, I was <laughs> going to say internet goer. That's kind of a, that's kind of a dumb term. <laughs> But you're one Basically, of the more, like, you've been on the internet for a while. I mean, at least yeah. longer than I have, because I discovered the internet late. I mean, I yeah. am younger than you, but yeah, I discovered I like, the internet late. I dabbled with fandom when I was like 11, after The Prisoner of Azkaban came out. And I joined the Emma Watson.net forums, because I was a huge Emma Watson fan. Mm -hmm. And it all kind of started there. Oh, man. I was on those forums for a long time. <laughs> So was that your was that your first fandom? Yeah, I'd say so. It wasn't like super fandomy. Like it was, it was a mix between like social and old school fandoms, and also what we've got now. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, you know, it was just an M Watson no, um, forum, and then they had all the um, the Harry Potter threads as well. And I started learning Photoshop because of all the people in the um, in the graphics threads, uh -huh. like old school. Like, look at my signature. Or I made a whole bunch of icons back before GIFs were the big thing. I made a whole bunch of icons and I put them in a .zip folder and you should download it. Well, no, <laughs> no. Back in my day, though, the, the big icons trend for me was when I was like in year 8 to 10, I'd say. Um, it was like you'd post them in a table on LiveJournal. I, man, I don't even know what live like, journal is. That's how much of a really? baby I am. Really? Oh, well, you're a tiny, tiny I know, one. <laughs> I know what it is. It's just I've never used it before. Yeah. Does it even exist anymore? It does. A lot of people are leaving at the moment because apparently something really shady has gone on with like the new terms and conditions. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but people mostly used it over the years for fan fiction. Mm, okay. So that was like, it was popular before the days of archive of our own and fanfiction.net and whatnot. yeah i think it was popular around the same time as fanfiction.net but there were some issues with like content that you're allowed to post on certain websites like um i think you couldn't post queer things without it getting rated higher or like lots of stuff you know there was lots of censorship you couldn't post anything dark so people tended to flock to live journal hmm. and then everyone sort of I'm pretty sure everyone started reacting on live journal as well. You know, like you can't post this kind of thing without this kind of rating. And then eventually archive of our own was created because there was all this kerfuffle on live journal. People just, you know, go through all the sites. 
Yeah, that's that's kind of one of the more progressive things about AO3, I think, because it was created by people who yeah. liked fan fiction. So it was kind of like an uncensored part of the internet where you could basically post whatever you wanted. Yeah. It was created because of all the, the ridiculous like censorship going around. And because people, back in the day, you couldn't post fanfic without a disclaimer because like, have you heard about all the stuff with Anne Rice and people writing fanfic on her books? Um, I you might have to explain it a little bit more. I might have heard of it. Yeah, don't, don't well, know by um, the name. I don't. I don't know what year, but like years and years ago, people used to um, you know, they'd write they're writing fan fiction of Anne Rice's books, and um, people got contacted by lawyers, and Anne Rice really, really hated the idea of fanfic, and there was all this legal stuff going on to fan fiction. And that's why it's so um. Lots of old school writers still put disclaimers at the start of their fanfics, like, I do not own this work. I'm just using the characters. Mm -hmm. That's sort of where they came from, all of the issues with lawyers and copyright. Oh, wow. I didn't, I mean. I know. Anne Rice's lawyers, man. They contacted a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess that kind of comes with territory. I, I mean, I've thought about that before, where what yeah. if this person that created this original content is like, well, you didn't really change a whole lot about this story. You're just kind of taking yeah. the characters and story I wrote and kind of expanding on it a little bit and not putting, like, your own spin on things, which is kind of stealing in a way. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is, though, people online aren't profiting from it, so... That's true. There's really, really no harm. That's very true. I mean... But yeah. um, it's such a it's such a widespread popular thing now that I don't think it's going to be a legal issue. I mean, it could be. I'm sure there's absolutely grounds for authors to now be like, I'm going to sue you for writing this, but I don't think it's, it's as likely anymore because it's so popular and normalized. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, man, we are jumping around. I wanted to get... I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to get in... Like, you are reading my mind, pretty much, because this is what I wanted to talk about later, but, it, you know, it, it's fine. Sorry. We can talk about it now. No, yeah. It, it's just... It's a very interesting thing about fan fiction where I, I kind of dabbled in this in the last episode, too, where um, mm. the line is drawn between the actual canon work and then what becomes the author of the fan fiction's work. And yeah, how, yeah. you know, can it be considered a serious art form when you are taking characters from another work and it's basically from, you know, a, an, an actual piece of art that was already there? Mm. Or is it, you know, is it just something that can only be for fun and not considered serious? I think there's oh, like kind no. of like two yeah. sides of that. I, I don't know what your opinion is on that, though. Oh, there's definitely multiple schools of thought. Like, I talk to people all the time who think that, you know, fan fiction is very, not to be taken seriously, often to be mocked. But, I mean, that is fair. I've read some, some I don't want to say terrible, because that's really rude. People are, you know, doing this for fun. But um, yeah. I've written some, like, you know, um, quality questionable fanfics over the years. And there's <laughs> obviously huge, there's huge leaps in the experience and techniques that people use. But I've also... I've read a few fanfics that are like works of art in their own. Like mm -hmm. there's one in particular that was absolutely phenomenal. It was um, Stop All the Clocks by Fire the Sound, which is an incredibly depressing uh, Harry Potter fanfic. So don't read it if you don't want to cry. <laughs> but like the way, the way it's all put together and the way it's written, it's absolutely, I think, a work of art, even though it is based on Harry Potter characters and completely non-canon. It's, you know, someone's taken that and they've created their own art. And I don't think... You know, it reaches a point where it's not just, it's not to be laughed at, you know. Mm -hmm. Some stuff, um, my model, might be, <laughs> you know, laughable. But, you know, everyone, I keep saying, you know, I'm so sorry. But, you know. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> it's a reflex. Yeah, um, it really is. But, yeah, people can still create, like, incredible things. Yeah. It's just a different, it's just a different art form. It's just, you know, inspired. I mean, if... If somebody is creating a piece of fan fiction and it's it's pretty much completely different than the canon work or mm. like changes a lot of things, really all you would have to do is change the names of the characters in there. Yeah, absolutely. And it would be their and own work. Done. But And that's been done. Yeah. Yeah. I it, it, and people it, it really has. That there way. have been published <laughs> novels that were fan fictions of something else at some point, and they just changed the names of the characters 
in the novel and then boom there you go you have your your own work but i think part... which is crazy yeah that is crazy it's crazy uh, that there's best selling novels out there that are published fan fiction with the names changed <laughs> <laughs> fucking nerds am i right <laughs> yep Basically. i mean even i've been like writing a fanfic at one point and gotten really deep into like uh different law and like world building and plot and thought wait a second maybe i should not write this as a fanfic and actually write this as its own thing oh my gosh i i share that exact that exact <laughs> point of view on something because you, why you know why am i putting so much energy into this when it's a fan fiction when i could just be when i could you know write it as an original yeah. piece of work but then that goes into when you're writing fan fiction you get that like instant feedback instant. yeah and basically That's you're so publishing important. work without actually publishing work and there's a lot more people that read fan fiction than people that go on websites like uh oh fuck meba.com is an example of like a casual writing website where people post their yeah. works people yeah. don't frequent like writing um forums anymore where you just post your your uh your works and then people read them like fan fiction yeah, is so much more popular you'd have much more luck you know becoming a moderately popular fanfic writer and then posting on your blog like hey who wants to check out my original stuff mm -hmm. that would be a much better route because yeah everything's fanfic these days because really you have the side of art let's just say writing where it's your self-expression but it's also you're creating this art for other people to enjoy and if the medium in which you are releasing that art form in this case writing is going to have more people see it when it's fan fiction then people are going to go that route that's what i did you know i'm expressing my creative self and also wanting to fulfill that need to create something that somebody else is going to want to read yeah yeah it's especially good too because in fandom you you know what people want to read mm -hmm. i mean you know you know what you'd like to read and you are a part of the audience because you're coming from the same fandom from the same fan fiction experiences but you know you know what people want to read and like to read and you can create something that you're going to enjoy or that people are going to enjoy mm -hmm. and you know I was going somewhere with that, and I lost it. But you get the, <laughs> the train of thought is left. The train left of your thought. Mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's okay. If you remember it, just 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 say so, and then we can go <laughs> back to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's so crazy to think that people are putting hours and hours, or hundreds of hours of their time into yeah. a, a piece of art and an art form, because obviously. The way I've been talking about fan fiction, I think it is it can be a serious art form. But Absolutely. Of course, you have the side of fan fiction, as you said, my immortal, which is arguably something created not to be taken serious. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. So I think you it, have that part too. I think it is its own work of art, like. But that's like comedy. That's getting about, into like comedy writing. Even just, maybe it was sort of like a look at fandom through a through a satirical lens or like look at fan fiction, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's no one really knows for sure whether Tara, the author was like making fun or being serious. And it's hard to tell, especially when you're at that age as an author, like early high school, mm -hmm. you know, you really can't tell whether it's going to be serious or whether it's making fun. But <laughs> if it is making fun, it is very intelligent. <laughs> If, yeah, if there's some mastermind author behind My Immortal, or if it was just some embarrassing yep. adolescent angst, like, fucking, you I'm know. pretty sure it was, um, sincere. <laughs> but that's I'm just, pretty sure it was sincere, that's yeah. That's crazy, though. If that was actually sincere, that's, that's, that's crazy. I think, I think it might have started sincere, and then as time went on, became more self-aware and more of a let's just make this let's hype this up let's let's use the text speak everywhere because you can see it progressively quotation marks get worse um <laughs> in terms of like writing style and grammar and that yeah i mean um, i wouldn't never... be surprised if it started sincere and became self-aware over time especially with all the attention that it got exactly the the infamous attention that it got yeah <laughs> 
it's, um, such, a, it's such a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like a wild ride. But I've like I'm pretty sure I've only I've never read it or attempted to read it. I've only seen like snippets from it. Snippets, yeah. So because you know everybody who reads fan fiction know knows what my immortal is and isn't what fa what technically fa well I can't speak English. What fandom <laughs> is that technically a part of? Um. Harry Potter. Yeah, that's what that's I thought. I don't want to say it be wrong. Though. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's a Harry Potter fanfic. Oh, God. Um, a very wild one. And the thing is that it's so infamous as being like the worst fanfic of all time, but there's plenty of other even wilder content or content on the same level out there that just didn't happen to get like viral, didn't happen to become a meme or a sensation. Mm -hmm. Just stuff that Pete, like somebody writes such a niche um yeah fanfic and then just nobody reads it and you know it's when you search the most niche thing ever and then go to the bottom of the tag and it has like three views on it that yeah. that's probably when you're gonna get into like the really terrible stuff but even i don't like calling somebody's art bad because that's yeah kind of, yeah absolutely i mean i mean obviously our point of views on fan fiction are that most of the time it is art because as long as they're contributing something that's of their own to it that it can be art you know absolutely i mean people are putting their hearts into this it doesn't matter if it's critically good it's still going to be art to them or to someone exactly and i mean for i know my immortal is a long fic isn't it yeah, I'm not actually sure how long it is, but I know it is long. So, I mean, at that point, you it. have to know that, it, I mean, unless it was posted all at once, which could make sense. No, but... it wasn't. It was okay, posted. Then, um... that, that has to be yeah, intentional. Chapter that chapter. It's, I, I don't believe that somebody would, because of all the people that would do, like, be hating it and stuff like that, and hating on it in the author, it has to be, like, in an intentional kind of bad satirical look on fandom and yeah fan that's fiction. why i think you know it gets progressively like excessive over time mm -hmm. exactly somebody just trying to well i wouldn't say take advantage of popularity but saying oh this could turn into to like actually something instead of yeah you know, i was awake at 2 30 a.m on like a saturday night and i had a couple of drinks or something and i just started writing this and then the next morning <laughs> i like turn on my computer like w wake up my computer and this is what was on my screen and like oh my god this is so bad i'm gonna post what it. what have i done <laughs> i'm gonna post it because it's so it's terrible so so tempting to post that kind of thing as well like post something you know bad or just ridiculous or poking fun at uh, the ridiculousness of fandoms it's so tempting i mean yeah i i've never it's just the fun my okay it's too it's pretentious <laughs> to say that my standards are too high but i just like i don't i couldn't i mean i couldn't do it like it would be too much of a hit to my my ego or something <laughs> like that you can be traditionally good in you know writing style and technique and yet still post something that's ridiculous that's true but uh, <laughs> I'm, i've I'm been thinking about posting it. like a series of really short pics that poke fun at um bad fandom like stereotypes of characters because you know sometimes in in fandom someone will take one aspect of a character and it'll get popular in a fanfic. And then suddenly every single fanfic is all about how this one character's only personality trait is that they like dinosaurs or something like that. And it just becomes <laughs> a sensation. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're in that same fandom when you know exactly who you are, you are talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we're, we're kind of, we've been talking about this for like 20 minutes so I think Whoops. we've beaten this. We've beaten this topic into submission. All but, right. All right. Yeah. I I that mean it's involved. it's interesting. Oh wait, was I, I? I think I was gonna make a point and then I forgot what I was going to say. Story of my life, man. Crap. It's all good. Yeah, <laughs> we both did it. See, you're not the only one. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, going back to the beginning, you were talking about like your your first fandom or whatever that you were part of yeah so 
what like what did you learn from being in that space where you know you kind of dove in and everything was uh everything was new around you and you've never you never had really experienced being in a community of people that mm. have similar interests to you so how did how did it affect you and what did you learn from it i mean it was like 13 years ago so <clears throat> sorry um <laughs> so it's like all very blurry i think you know the basics like there there are heaps of people out there who who love this thing as much as you do in the same way you do and yeah. then um it was uh, it would have been i got into the emma watson forums before the harry potter books ended so mm -hmm. i got to i got to experience not as severely as some people who were more you know older and properly active and like writing early fan fiction and being on a live journal and different different forums um but you know i saw i saw like the outskirts of shipping wars and like Harry Hermione versus Harry Ron was a big thing back in the day. Oh, God. You know, shipping wars, shipping wars are always, they're, they're in every fandom, you know? Um, so I saw like the beginnings of that. And I was a bit on the outskirts as well. Cause as a young girl, I was very much, I wanted Harry and Luna to be end game as a 12 year old. They were my, they were like my first OTP. And then I was, I was pretty much mostly, um, involved in like the design aspect. I wasn't very good because I was like 12 years old and I had a really early version of Photoshop, but you know, um, back then it was all like wallpapers and icons and signatures. And, mm -hmm. um, there were all these people who were making incredible, incredible art on this forum and they all inspired me to learn Photoshop. Nice. And that was pretty much the, my, my most significant first fandom experience was like learning Photoshop through others and making lots of beautiful really not beautiful harry potter wallpapers and signatures and then <laughs> eventually i'm pretty sure i moved into the twilight fandom as i got into like the eighth grade nice nice what yeah. a great phase oh yeah it was beautiful uh -huh. it didn't it did not last very long but yeah i was into it for a while i remember i remember kind <laughs> of the twilight phase in middle school where for like a year and a half it was cool to like Twilight. Yeah, yeah. But then anything past that was like, oh, this is getting tired, you know? I'm pretty sure it was kind of like the um the first, like the year before the movie came out, it was cool to like because everyone loved the books. Uh-huh. Everyone was super into it. And then um the first movie came out, and then I remember me and all my friends, we were we, we saw the first movie, and at first we liked it because we were still in sort of that bubble of, I love Twilight. I love Edward Cullen. Any content is good content. So we loved the movie when it came out. And then I think maybe like over the course of the next few months, we gradually just realized this movie is kind of terrible. This story is kind of terrible. <laughs> and it all just like gradually fell apart. I think people just, you know, the bubble popped and everyone sort of looked at it from an outside lens and were like, okay, maybe this is really lame. <laughs> Maybe this is really lame. Maybe we should not be obsessed with this. <laughs> I actually went to a a um Breaking Dawn book launch party. Mm hmm Yeah, when I was like fourteen. I think I was fourteen, maybe fifteen. That was that was interesting. <laughs> sounds really dorky, yeah. It was really dorky, but it was kind of cute. I don't remember much of it. I just remember me and my high school friends, we all sort of dressed up. We all made ourselves like really pale looking like vampires and um oh God. you rocked up to like the uh, bookstore in the city and you all got badges depending on whether you were team edward or team jacob or team switzerland and it was pretty cute i think people just played games and stuff that it's funny how you mention uh that makeup because this is this is unrelated well it's related yeah. to makeup <laughs> but the first time i practiced putting on stage makeup um, my foundation was like two or three shades too light. <laughs> so I put it on and it looked like a freaking vampire. Yeah, That's like the that opposite cool. problem people usually have. People usually um, tend to start off doing makeup with foundation that's too dark for them. Yeah, but it, the problem wasn't me. Like I wasn't the one that ordered my foundation. The kind of the person running the like the theater thing because what we were doing in the one acts is this his name was phil i mean 
yeah, it's not too much to disclose that his name was Phil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Phil was directing the competition one act that we were doing, and then there were two other ones that were directed by another lady, and then I was in a student-directed one. Um, so he ordered my foundation, and he ordered the right shade for my skin tone, but he ended up giving me the wrong one that he ordered for somebody else and this like there there is a girl in that was in the cast that literally has pretty much she is albino like she has an albino mm. skin tone so she's really white and Same. uh my foundation was lighter than her foundation so wow you can it was basically, so it was basically just basically powder just white yeah it was basically just like it was clown, like i smeared <laughs> baking soda on my face pretty much it was super beautiful. white and you could like see the red around my eyes. I literally looked like a vampire. Yeah, so, you definitely yeah. would have looked like a Twilight vampire, Long... especially in the um, the older, the the later movies. Uh -huh. It's not as obvious in the uh, first one because I I rewatched it the other night when I was really bored and I was editing. Yeah. Um, the first one I used to make fun. I used to make fun all the time back when it just came out. Um, that the original Twilight was ridiculous because the whole thing is blue, and honestly. That's true. They really could have mixed up like the the color grading for some scenes, but mm -hmm. um, the blue actually makes the makeup look so much better. The vampires do not look as ridiculous in the first movie as yeah. they do later on. Exactly, because this then is such a tangent. <laughs> if they, yeah, it really is. Sorry, I, I'm the one that derailed this <laughs> entire thing. critics with um, Sam. <laughs> yeah, useless tangents with Sam. Yeah, um, what was I gonna say? I was going to say something. We were talking uh, about uh, vampires and Twilight and color grading. And... Yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to say that um, if, if the vampires actually looked like that and they wanted to stay concealed in, like, the, the community, that wouldn't you think something would be up? Like, this dude looks so pale. Yeah, sure. He looks like he's diseased. He like, are you okay? <laughs> Like, do you have? It's like on iZombie. They all wise up and start getting fake tans. Oh, so they nice. Don't stand out. I should like really. Silicon. I should watch iZombie. It's really good. I'm really enjoying it. It's the one show I'm actually keeping up to date with at the moment. Because I watch, um, I watch a YouTube group called Funhouse. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't think I've watched anything. They're a part of of Rooster Teeth. Um. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have one of the actors from iZombie on their various shows once in a while. His first name's oh. Raul. I can't remember his last name. Yes, I love him. He's gorgeous. <laughs> he he is. He's is a very good-looking man, but he <coughs> he has um he comes on their video sometimes, so that's how I know iZombie is through that. And he's a funny dude and he's a likable dude, so I might yeah. I might have to check it out. He's so charming. Exactly. And that accent, man. A plus. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's a beautiful man. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not as uh, as special for you, you know, an English accent because Australian accents and English accents are pretty pretty no, much go hand still, in hand. They're definitely still a novelty. There's there's a there's a big difference once you have them side by side. So English accents well, yeah, are definitely true. still a novelty, exactly. especially when you've got an English character in a cast of Americans as well. Exactly. That just stands out even more. When it's like the posh London type accent, <laughs> it's not even a posh accent. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> you know, um, everything is posh to an American. Exactly. Is the vibe I get. <laughs> well, I mean, if I if I was listening to his accent right now, I would be able to, t you know, tell. I just assumed it was posh because that's usually what you find in any movie if the actor is british they usually say okay just do the posh one so people can know your <laughs> accent i know that that's a fact um yeah i mean it's like how american tv has sort of a neutral accent as well doesn't it um and dub voice actors for anime have yeah. a general accent like they are not accented at all it's like what the heck is happening i can't pinpoint where you're from you're just from <laughs> north america i guess is your accent yeah it's just a neutral can't place it accent exactly i mean you kind of have to do that because you know i don't know you don't 
you don't get a drastic change in accents in America as much as you do in England because literally you go 10 miles one direction and the accent is completely different yeah, from 10 miles absolutely. in the other direction. I love it. It's fascinating. It's a little ridiculous, but ling people that are <laughs> interested in linguistics like I am, yeah, it's super fascinating how England so has cool. that many accents. Um, yeah, Australia doesn't have much in the way of... um accent differences there's like a spectrum from broad to cultured broad is really like crikey crocodile dandy like broad and <laughs> yeah. then cultured is more of the like uh english australian accent where you sound sort of english and people not from australia would mistake you for british so is that like is that more of an urban accent which the cultured one the, the cultured one? one yeah um it's more of a i think it's um an Adelaide thing or people always talk about it in Australia as being an Adelaide thing. Like people from Adelaide sound a bit more posh. I think it just depends on like, you know, your family. It's not really suburb dependent. It can be like in the outer suburbs where I am, people tend to be a lot more broad on the, the stereotypical end of the spectrum. But <clears throat> I think it just depends on, you know, your, your family and like how you grew up. Like, I'm a bit more on the cultured end of the spectrum. Like I'm a bit more posh than most people. And that's, I'm pretty sure that's because I did like 13 years of the Australian Girls Choir. So in the Australian <laughs> Girls Choir, <clears throat> sorry, it, it, you're, um, you're always doing really proper vowel sounds. Yeah, and, exactly. It's, yeah, yeah, that's what, it's just that's, a little thing. Yeah. That's what they taught us here too, is you have to enun enunciate everything. So um, that naturally gives you an accent. So that, it makes sense. So rolling, rolling back to what we were talking about, um, man, that tan tangent just went everywhere. Just I am accents. sorry, people who are listening right now. You must hate us right now. Um, um, yeah. So what I, what I was going to ask you after you finished explaining what your first fandom was, until I totally freaking derailed it. Um, Whoops. So like, I, was there? I helped. <laughs> what? Sorry. I helped. Don't worry. I definitely helped. Oh, they, don't worry about it. It was. Can, I will take one hundred percent of the blame. Um, so from that first fandom that you were a part of, was there anything that, when you came out of it, you were kind of like, oh, that wasn't bless you, jeez. So sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah. We probably should have done this when I wasn't sick. Kiara has a cold right now, <laughs> so. It, that's why Lots she's sneezing. sneezing and sniffling and well you haven't I been sniffling so i You've tried been... to muffle it <laughs> no it, like i haven't noticed it so it's it's fine okay, you're doing a great job um yeah so was there anything that you took away from your first fandom and you were kind of like uh that wasn't the greatest or it just left a bad taste in your mouth no not really um the emma watson forums are really chill i mean I, I'm, I was quite young, so I don't remember all of it. Like, I think the biggest thing would have been shipping wars, but I wasn't really involved in that. Like I said, I was mostly in, like, the graphics area and just the general discussion. It was all really nice for me. Like, I made a lot of online friends who I kept for, like, a few years after I left the forums or, like, they became less popular. So that was actually it was a very nice and pleasant first fandom experience. No real drama at all that I remember, which hmm. is good for, like, you know, a 12-year-old. Yeah, that's you don't want to go through too much, too much shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. I mean, for for me, I don't really remember exactly what the first fandom I was involved with, but like the first one I can really remember is the uh, the Avatar: Last Airbender slash Legend of Korra fandom is really the one uh, that was yeah involved with first, which was fairly <laughs> recent. But that like I only found out that fandoms worth. Thing after i got on tumblr in like 2013 yeah yeah so. that's the way it is for most people and uh, you know fandom has changed a lot since tumblr was created like it's mm -hmm. a very it hasn't changed too much but you know aspects of it and it's a very it's a very well known thing now it's become quite widespread it's not as niche anymore exactly and tumblr has a huge a huge part of man i can't string words together in a freaking in a coherent order um it's really 
a huge reason why it is as popular as it is because Tumblr makes it so accessible for you to find information. You know, that blog roll thing is such a... Yeah. You just hit follow and then the stuff just shows up in your dash and you're like, wow, I don't have to look for this. It's great. It's all right there. That's one of the main yeah. reasons why I love Tumblr. I mean, there are many drawbacks to it, but a huge advantage is that you have all this stuff here and it's tagged for you and you just go through it and you don't have to go searching through forums for it. It's really annoying. It's so good. It's and I it's um it's changed like um influentially what's popular in sort of like the photoshop world because you know when i was 12 it was all about wallpapers and signatures and like doing really detailed interesting things with photoshop and now everything's about gifts absolutely exactly. everything is about gifts which mm -hmm. uh, really started from tumblr because because of the reblogging feature exactly which wasn't a wasn't a feature on any other website gift sets yeah i mean i was on tumblr before photo sets were even a thing Mm -hmm. back when if you wanted to post like a photo set type gif you had to put them all into one image Oof. yeah so like <laughs> back a in fake photo set days. so you just have a big canvas and then you kind of paste all of your yeah your stuff yeah in. all the different like scenes and just like little blocks oh that sounds terrible <laughs> yeah photo sets were revolutionary wow it sounds like it i didn't know it was that <laughs> I remember hard when they yeah. first came out yeah um, what was I going to say? Yeah, and even, like, headers and themes, too, are also a huge thing. Like, people making mm. their own themes through HTML and stuff like that on Tumblr. True. People do so much cool stuff with themes. And then a bunch of annoying stuff, too, like autoplay music. Yeah, autoplay. <laughs> all, all those, like, snowflakes and then the custom cursor that makes everything lag. Uh-huh. And then the text is super, super small. <laughs> that's great. super super small and a light gray on a white background so you've really got a squid sorry if you have this kind of theme on <laughs> tumblr it's like, okay as long it's, as it's like, okay like but it. it's a little bit annoying and you might want you to consider do changing what you it like that's why i mean when this feature first came out on tumblr which is like the dashboard view of blogs yeah i really didn't like it because i was like i'm clicking their blog i just want to go to that page mm -hmm. but um it's actually really useful because, exactly. um, you know, you can look at it in a standard view, which is great for if you are having trouble reading someone's theme. Plus, if you have Xkit, it's so much easier to reblog stuff just using that side feature. Hmm, yeah. I wonder what would happen if they actually developed coherent de developers at Tumblr. <laughs> I don't, think. I don't think we're happen. ever going to find out. <laughs> Xkit would It'd be happen. great to have a search feature in the instant messenger. I mean, messenger, it's not... You know. Yeah, it's not my place to judge, though, because they're probably at, like, the mercy of Yahoo. So yeah, absolutely. It's not It's not fair to it's be like, you guys actual... suck. Yeah. This is probably a shit ton of red tape they have to go through to get anything done. And plus, the, you know, the people doing a lot of the work are probably not the ones making the decisions, so... Exactly. Someone higher up says, like, get rid of replies, and they just have to say okay sure <laughs> that makes want. a whole lot of sense <laughs> did you just want to watch everyone blow up or is there a reason <laughs> and then uh and then uh allowing people to edit your reblogs that was also a great idea which yeah. exec had that idea <laughs> i mean that was just the original layout of tumblr they didn't really think about that that was so bad and then that whole like john green thing where oh god <laughs> poor guy <laughs> what a i love john game. green he's such a cinnamon roll why do people oh, do this the... to him? yeah i know <laughs> or, or like people do the same thing with a staff tumblr as well just make a text post that looks like it's from the staff tumblr like <laughs> <laughs> we're shutting the website down on tuesday say goodbye say goodbye bitches <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh good times good times in the tumblr fandom Oh shit, I just saw Tumblr fandom. Nobody's a fan of Tumblr. I, I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of. If kinda... they are, then you and disillusioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People, it, it's always cool to say that you hate Tumblr, but then people just spend all of their time on there. So they're just trying to be cool. I do hate it, but I'm trapped. I can't leave, you know? Too many. Well, really, you come for the bullshit, <laughs> and then you come for the bullshit, and then you stay for the people you meet 
on yeah there. absolutely absolutely because i've met a lot met of so cool, people cool people on tumblr let me tell you right that's what's amazing about the internet like i have a friend who is from san francisco and obviously i'm from melbourne in australia um and we talk like all the time we're such close friends we've been talking for what are we going on a year in like july mm -hmm. and you know she's like one of my closest friends these days that's awesome and that's all because of the internet and that's crazy the internet is amazing tumblr is amazing no matter what you say well there are arguments <laughs> against it but there, there i go it has meeting the status down, quo like again everything. yeah um yeah so oh look at that tumblr was the next thing i wanted to talk about i'm a bad host what about tumblr <laughs> okay fine. um because what the things that we have talked about like you touched on shipping wars which is the dumbest term <laughs> i've ever heard in my life um it is what it is <laughs> um and like just general discourse in a fandom is yeah. tumblr a good place to have a fan base or not like uh, do you think people get that too very passionate topic. about it because i think i mean yeah keep you going. go you go ahead no no no, you go i'm good oh come on we're not gonna do this right now are we um <laughs> you want okay. me saying you i go yeah I, I will go okay like um Ingrid was touching upon it uh, when I was... You listened to that podcast, right? My interview with Ingrid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, She touched yeah, yeah. upon it a little bit, that it can get a little bit, you know, toxic on Tumblr. But um, yeah. that that's basically anywhere is something that I yeah, pointed out anywhere, and that she that. agreed with. Um, but, I mean... I mean, what are your thoughts on it? Like, I just want your opinion on if Tumblr is a good place to have, like... To put put your content. Um. Well, it's really dependent. Like, it can be toxic, but I think any sort of place on the internet where people come together is going to be like that. Like, you'll have the same sort of stuff on forums. It's just, it's Tumblr has become so popular and such a huge meeting ground for fans that it's just. I think it's you know magnified a lot the whole like toxic aspect of it people have always been you know nasty on the internet though like even like that's true like 15 years ago like you'll read stories about all this drama in the harry potter fandom um online where people would like make fake accounts and start doing all this all this crap and um mm -hmm. you know there there are there are a lot of stories out there and there's like the whole um deal with Cassandra Clare back when she posted fanfic. There's all these like essays on her plagiarism. You know, the drama has always been there. I think it's just, there's so many more people together on Tumblr engaged in fandoms and engaged in the relationship of social justice issues in relation to fandoms that it's, it's very magnified now and it seems like it's worse. I think it's just, you know, it's just all in the one place. Yeah. Was that? I what was your question? I got totally lost. <laughs> what? What? What'd you say? <laughs> I completely forgot what the original question was. It. It was. I just went off. <laughs> um. Do you think Tumblr is a good place to have a fan base? It was the original. Yeah. Question. I mean, I don't think it would be this popular and this effective if it wasn't a good place. I can't think of um another website that would do what Tumblr does right now in terms of like posting things and getting that validation from reblogs and getting that community because you know forums aren't quite like that and there twitter's twitter is the closest thing you've got but it's not quite the same it's not as um personal exactly all the all the yeah all the retweets and that they sort of they they get they get a lot more distant you can't you know add comments and and so on mm-hmm I'd say I say it is a good place, but you know, like all things on the internet that comes at a price, there's always going to be bad factors to it. Exactly, and you know, th there's always a line that has to be drawn as well, where some people are always going to get way too into it and uh, mm -hmm. just going to kind of dive off the deep end of it, and then be way too defensive of of this like yeah going back to yeah. shipping wars like why why are you putting your fictional like your head canon of this like romantic relationship with a character over somebody else's because really ultimately when you look at it it does not matter yeah so absolutely 
I mean, but people also get so serious about it. It's it's people in my opinion, it's people's um it's people does people's desire to kind of have conversation about it and yeah the the conversation kind of you know um gives them validation for what they think almost you know yeah i mean everyone on tumblr in fandoms they're talking about things that they're really really passionate about but most likely the people in their day-to-day lives don't have any clue about or you know can't relate to like maybe you're a huge fan of the Vampire Diaries and no one at school is. And then you've got, and you're really passionate about it. You've got all these emotions about it. And the only place you can share them is the internet. And I think because of the fact that you actually get to interact with people who understand that level of passion, that's why things get so blown up and everything gets so intense. Also the fact that a lot of the people involved in drama and stuff like that tend to be younger not always like there are mm-hmm. plenty of adults out there who are who are starting shit and causing drama but a lot of it does come from younger people as well which is just kind of part of the learning process like you're passionate about something when you're younger and it seems like the biggest thing in the world mm-hmm. and and everything just blows up yeah exactly and then it gets bigger than you you know it just spirals yeah. out of control um i was gonna say I was going to say something else too. Um, And really it's where if the argument is getting that big and then basically it can sometimes transcend the argument and then a label gets put on an entire group of people on the internet. I'm talking about super hulak. If you didn't know what I was talking (laughs) about, Uh, (laughs) that was a joke. Um, So, Sometimes it can transcend the argument and then an entire group of people is labeled this way. And then that's how stereotypes against the entire website um, form. And I think it's kind of amazing how this, how a little argument about one thing about a show can spiral into something and transcend the argument and become bigger and then tarnish an entire website's reputation. Yeah, absolutely. All those dominoes. Exactly. And then you have people, you have the emergence of, like, um, the term feminazi or, or like, um, stuff. <laughs> Did I just hear a cringe? <laughs> it kind of sounded like you but... cringe. You were like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I did cringe. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that term either, but it, it's, you know. It's these out are, there. These are it's terms that. that are used against, like, Tumblr, Tumblr users because yeah. Pe- people that are equally as passionate as one another are coming around and you know talking about issues like feminism and equal rights and racism and and things like that Ooh, yeah awkward silence <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that term actually originated on tumblr i think it might have come because it's been around for a while yeah it probably has and i guess i phrased that wrong that's not what i meant no no i mean it's used in conjunction with tumblr a lot and yeah like in association absolutely with um yeah just to correct it um yeah that awkward silence was from um delays probably so probably yeah, yeah uh, you're in australia a long ways away <laughs> near far wherever you are exactly <laughs> what was the question <laughs> um that wasn't Sorry. that there that wasn't, wasn't that really, kind of spiraled really off the last one um <laughs> but do you think i'll just move on to another one do you think okay. that being in a fandom <laughs> can be unhealthy to a point absolutely definitely um depending on the kind of fandoms you're involved in and how emotionally invested you are. Like for, for some people, it's kind of like their support and all they've really got as like a safe haven in what is a ridiculous world to be living in. Um, yeah, <laughs> I got lost. <laughs> it Derailed can definitely again. be damaging. Like um, just, just because like, okay, all of the all of the discourse and all that, it can be ridiculously helpful, especially in terms of, you know, um, social justice issues. It can be helpful and educational, but it can also be damaging in the way that people present it. Like um, a few years ago, back in like 2012, when I was um, 
like moderately big in the Teen Wolf fandom. I made a few posts about a scene in an early episode and um, everyone, I got all these, I started getting all these anonymous messages about how I was um, victim blaming a character and, um, and contributing to rape culture. And that was all stuff at the time that I had no idea about. Um, I didn't know anything about sort of like feminism or any issues like that. And this experience, it was, it was, it was so emotionally, um, like daunting at the time because I was just getting all these anon hate messages and um some people were trying to be um nice and educational about it and some people were just like going off as people tend to do when they can be anonymous on the internet yeah they were just you know streaming hate it got to the point where I was like too anxious to check my ass box like I'd see I had a message and I'd get like heart palpitations which is something that can happen to like so many people on websites like this mm-hmm. it did end up being a positive thing though because you know I was like I have no idea what these people are talking about so I'm gonna go read up and learn about it and see what they're talking about now I'm a huge feminist and um it was such a learning experience and a gateway to a new world but you mm-hmm. know the way people present these things and the way people just tend to you know, get the get the swords out immediately as soon as they're anonymous and just go for the kill. Yeah. Can, it can be a very damaging space, Phantom. As much as it can be a safe haven for people, it can be very toxic. And especially when there are so many people online who are young and who are emotionally vulnerable. And then there are all these adults as well who do know more and are more educated, but can be angrier. And they'll be targeting these like 14 year olds online telling them how wrong they are not considering the fact that this is you know this is a kid this is a kid who's still learning exactly and oh, yeah not being constructive about it is yeah definitely a bad thing about the internet in general not only tumblr but of course everywhere the yeah. arguments that get like exposed that have taken place on tumblr are definitely you know they're infamous and you know it's definitely become a part of tumblr's reputation as absolutely, like a absolutely. bunch of overpassionate people that are getting way too mad over stuff which happens yes it does there are a lot of dumb things that people on tumblr get mad over where mm-hmm. some things you should be you know thinking about i mean be- just because you know thing a happens doesn't automatically mean it equates to thing b you know yeah so and I mean, the difference mentality. is between like, hmm, sorry. And then mob mentality takes over. Mob obviously. mentality, yeah, that is a huge, huge problem on Tumblr, like a massive deal. We should come back to that because boy, do I have some feelings on the hive mind of Tumblr. Yeah. But um, um, the I think that's sort of like the difference is between people getting like, um, up in arms about you know shipping wars or you know fandom things versus people getting up in arms and expressing themselves in not necessarily the right way about social justice issues is that at least for the latter, the issues are coming from the, um, the response is coming from a really personal place. And like anger is not the best way to educate someone and to help people and make change. But it's also understandable that people are going to come from a place of anger if they've been oppressed or if they've experienced something awful, it does make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. it's just sort of when those two things start to um intersect that it becomes a huge issue like fandom and social justice stuff intersecting um and then the hive mind of it all um it reaches a point where people are you know they're not letting they're not letting anyone like fiction as it is just being fiction they're not mm-hmm. letting people um you know for example you can't like this ship because it's abusive you can't you know just simply enjoy the fictional aspect and finding these two characters interacting interesting and you're not allowed to write fanfic about it because it's harmful and toxic no one's really letting anybody separate the um the issues and the fact that liking or liking something or you know enjoying a relationship between two characters that you know is technically toxic doesn't mean you condone it or doesn't mean that you're trying to promote it it just mm-hmm. means that you found something interesting to explore through fan fiction or through television or et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a big issue online right now. Like I think that's become something at the forefront of fandom issues like the past year or so. All I of mean, this policing of not being able to like content without yeah. 
you know, liking it, meaning you're apparently condoning it or you're saying it's good. Exactly. And yeah, like you said, separating the fiction from the actual yeah. issues in real life. And it's something that I've only recently become aware that it was an issue. Um, of course, you know, in our perspectives that, you know, the fandoms that we participate in are more anime oriented, at least at this point in time. So, and shipping, at least on Tumblr, is a huge part of that website. Um, yeah, yeah, huge part. So that in our kind of space that we are in that is at the forefront but then i mean i don't know i don't watch a lot of live action shows anymore because they just don't interest me that much like my interest is yeah. in animation and obviously the this center for animation is japan right now so yeah <laughs> obviously i'm gonna like anime so in the animation sphere shipping is a huge thing i'm not sure how that equates to like a live action thing and i think you oh it's watched definitely more a huge thing me. in live action so yeah, yeah you can speak more about it than i can oh yeah it's definitely a huge thing in like all fandoms like i'm um not as much active as i was like six months ago but i'm relatively into the um harry potter fandom and the fanfic for that and um, that's a huge thing in the harry potter fandom and that's a book fandom and then it's a huge thing in tv fandoms as well like there's been a lot of drama recently about um a relationship on Supergirl, which was between um Kara and Monel, which I'm completely behind on Supergirl, so I can't actually like say an opinion on it, but I know a lot of people were upset that these characters got together because it was apparently toxic and and because one of the one of the characters was really manipulative and all that. But it's still it's definitely a big thing in all the fandoms, not just um anime stuff. I see it around all the time. All right, yeah. Because I'm like I have such a niche taste in in TV shows, especially live action ones. So mm. it really has to yeah. have a unique aspect to hook me in, and not many do. I'll watch anything. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, we've kind of beaten down this topic as well. But it's just so <laughs> it's so interesting to just to look into it. You know. Yeah, there there's so much to dissect there. It really. It, there really is um and what you were saying about the mob mob mentality thing is you know i'm guilty it's i think everybody like everybody that has used tumblr or some other social media is guilty of a bunch of people on my dash think this so obviously that's so the i'm right, gonna think it too that's the right yeah absolutely way to think. and then it drives something, me nuts that i've done it too yeah and then something else comes along that changes your perspective and you're like oh wait that's not the only opinion that people have on this. And yeah. what I was thinking before, you know, doesn't isn't really what I actually should think because I only had one side of the story, you know. And then you also get to the point where you don't know what you do actually think because, like, do you have your own original um, impression on this or do, are you just regurgitating everyone else's? So that's, exactly. um, that's been a thing, the hive mentality thing has been around for like years like back in like the early 2000s um the harry potter fandom that was um a big thing back then like there were it, it tends to happen um when like to use an old term big name fans who are like relatively popular fans in a fandom yeah. um they have one opinion and then all their followers um or friends all you know they they take that opinion too and it gets popular and everyone's reading it and everyone's saying well if this person's saying it and they're popular or, or if lots of people are saying it, it's got to be true. Um, like, even in the early Harry Potter days, that um, whole mentality of uh, Slytherins are being oppressed in the narrative, um, that was a, that's been around for, like, decades. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are a few, like, big fanfic writers who had this sort of mentality of Slytherins are oppressed, which is really not canon or narratively true at all. Um, and then, because they were... Um, popular writers and they had these ideals it's just spread over time and everyone sort of thinks that or at least you know a large portion of the fandom will believe that whether mm -hmm. it's true or not whether it's canon or not yeah. just because um a few you know big name fans had this idea and it just spreads and spreads and that exactly. happens on tumblr all the time mm -hmm. i mean 
I mean, you can shift that into other spheres in the world. You can shift yeah. that into politics. You can shift that into yeah, absolutely. basically anything. But this is not a political podcast, so we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so how, like, I spend a fair amount of my time on social media because I've just, like... Yep. It's just what I like to do. I like to interact with people and see what people are creating um, in certain fandoms and stuff. And, of course, everybody has an obsession with something, you know. And mm -hmm. um, So Absolutely. I like to spend my time on social media. But, I mean, do you think there is a line where you are participating too much in this fandom and it's becoming more of an obsession, like an unhealthy obsession, rather than just like, I'm passionate about this and I like this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I've definitely been there before. Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends a lot on your outside circumstances. Like, you know, sometimes it can get to the point where, you know, obviously people tend to keep coming back to fandom and interacting with fandom because it makes them feel good. You know, yeah. they've got, they might have validation from fanfic or they might just have friends online who, you know, understand their feelings about something. Um, so you keep coming back to it because it makes you feel good. Um, although I think, you know, from my experience, if you're not having a great time outside of the internet world, it can become a bit of a crutch and mm -hmm. it definitely becomes an obsession at some point. It's not necessarily always bad. You know, I mean, it depends how extreme it gets. I think the, um, perspective on it is going to be also different depending on whether people do involve themselves in fandom a lot or whether they're more of a real world, non-internet person. Yeah. Because from an outside perspective, it's just like when your parents think that you're always on the computer and um, and you're doing absolutely nothing in there. Uh, whereas from your perspective, you're talking to people and you're socializing. Mm -hmm. You know, from an outside perspective, people are going to think that fandom fandom is an obsession, even if it's just a even if it's just actually like a low key thing from an internet perspective. Mm -hmm. But it can it can definitely get to the point where it's an obsession or it's you know a bit of a crutch which i have no idea if that's it can it can be a bad thing but what is there to do about it i don't know i think yeah. it tends to be just a case-to-case -case personal basis depending on you know someone's own personality and and what's going on in their life yeah yeah i think that was a really great answer because you touched you touched upon a lot of different perspectives and, and mm. now as you kind of attempted to answer that question, I was just like, this question is kind of loaded. Um, <laughs> I did not like, I was just jotting down questions that came to mind and this one came <laughs> to mind. And now I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, that's actually kind of hard to answer because you you right away could could see that there are a lot of different circumstances around the internet. Yeah. Like maybe this person is in like, a bad bad household and has an abusive yeah. relationship with their parents or something like that and being in a fandom is how they cope with that or you have on the flip side where this person is like a a potato who doesn't do anything and doesn't look for a job or whatever like Maybe that well. which is very very the <laughs> the minority of people that participate in fandom um that's me but that's what what people on the outside of like the internet yeah. sphere see when they look in is that this person is just sitting around the computer and not not doing anything productive at all. When in actuality, a lot of these people are socializing just in a different medium, and yeah. that's that can be frustrating for people who do the stuff that we do. You know? Yeah, I mean, even then, people who are in fandoms in their own fandoms and who um engage in it in a different way can still see other people as having an obsession, like. I'm totally guilty of that. I'll see the, I'll, I'll, I can be pretty judgmental the way in which, the way in which people are fans of something. And like, I'll see, I'll see someone in real life. I'm thinking of a very specific girl, but I'm not going to go into it because that would be horribly mean. Um, but <laughs> you know, you'll see, you'll see the specific way some people are fans of something and you'll be like, that's really lame or embarrassing, etc. cetera. Um, like the whole super who thing, like, everyone mocks the, um, the super Hulok fandom or like, you know, derivatives of that um, on a website where everybody is engaged in fandom to like a similar level. Mm -hmm. and it's just kind of, you know, there, there are popular groups and, and nerdy groups and sort of there's a high school click hierarchy of fandoms on Tumblr, which is interesting. Cause like, 
as, as much as you want to be level headed about it, be like, well, this person could be that level obsessed because they have X, Y, Z going on. You're still often going to be judgmental. Like I'll still see someone and be like, wow, you need to chill. Like, yeah, why exactly. are you so annoying? Uh -huh. As much as I want to be like cool about it. Yeah. Everyone's still a bit of an asshole sometimes. Yeah, and then you have that layer as well where even in within your fandom, you have these people are really level-headed yep. and you can reason yeah. reason with them. And then you go on Tumblr and it's like you scroll through the recent tag and it's just like a bunch of low-effort reposts like... Um, yeah yeah <laughs> like text posts or whatever or pictures and like, then don't like, steal gifts <laughs> yeah don't steal gifts or people's fan art Please and saying haha gifts. not mine i didn't do this but it's really pretty it's like no it's, don't do that just stop just please reverse image search and reblog the original and post. then <laughs> yeah hard. exactly there's literally you can search by image on tumblr and find the source and then ask them if if you know if they don't mind you reposting with credit it's hmm. really super easy um, anyways, what I was going to say is uh, you have these people and then, you know, you also have the people that are like using a bunch of tropes in their text posts and head cannons or something like that. And like reducing characters to like one dement, like something yeah, one dimensional. Gosh, that drives and then me nuts. it's like, who am I to look at this person and say, you're doing this wrong when this is just, they're just doing this for enjoyment like why am i looking true. down on somebody doing this true like it's it's great to self-reflect on that once in a while and just be like okay just chill just let them do what they want to do and they're going to let you do what you do maybe they think you are keying way too in to being in your fandom and like yeah thinking about it way too much maybe that's true you know <laughs> very yeah. true mm-hmm it's so, good to take a step back. It's hard to take a step back, though, because you're so involved in it. And you get so caught up in, you know, the hive mentality or your own opinions on something. Exactly. I mean, I guess art reposting is also a mob mentality for people who know artists. That's a perspective. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we'll we'll move on from this. Um, but, yeah, that was great. That was a great conversation. Um, good answer, Kiara. You're a you're a smart gal. Um, oh, Ty. Mm -hmm. God, I just said Ty. I feel like I've just stepped out of 2010. I'm still in high school right now. Oh gosh, I am guilty of abbreviating way too many things. I love how. Well, okay, I'm gonna go on a tangent here. Yep. Um, I love how when I first got on like social media and stuff like that, and like Tumblr and stuff, I would refuse to to like use slang and stuff like that and abbreviate. <laughs> yeah and i would always uh i would always uh like spell things correctly and use yeah, the correct grammar. grammar and yeah. uh and now it's just like i don't <laughs> i don't give a shit like yeah it's bad the linguistics the linguistics aspect of fandom and the internet is so interesting because there's you know there's trends of what's cool like when I was in like year eight, everyone had just started going online and everyone was using like text speak in the classic, like use the letter U for you and use the number two for two. And then like halfway through high school, we all became like quotation marks enlightened. And we were like, no, you know, it's superior to type with perfect grammar all the time. And then this, you know, idea of superiority kept on for a few years. And then all of a sudden it became sort of ironic to start using lol again and start using text speak and that's just derailed into everyone's back to writing not necessarily in text speak like the um like 2006 era text speak but um you know really low-key stripped back slang on the internet and that's the new way to type sort of in mm -hmm. a in a bit of an apathetic way it's it's so interesting i love watching linguistic trends in the internet it's so cool exactly and then you have uh you have like five thousand different ways to say LOL now. Like <laughs> yeah. like L E L L O L O L O L. -L. Like God. It's so it's so strange how it works. And then you have like shout speak and like some letters are capitalized and some aren't and that mm. like is supposed to represent like disgruntled shouting or whatever. Yeah. Or like voice crack or whatever. And it's like it there's so many emotions you can convey through how you type it. But it's just so absurd. Like, I'm going to add 5,000 commas after this to show that I'm distressed. <laughs> you know, 
it's so yeah. it's so weird but like then in, you start yeah. talking about it and you're like this is so weird why do we do this <laughs> It's just so bizarre how things change. Like 2007, you would have written LOL in like all caps and you would have written it because something was funny. Mm -hmm. And now if I ever write LOL, it's on the end of a sentence. It's punctuation. And it's it is punctuation sarcastic. now. It's, it's punctuation. It's like, it's also like tone affection. Like at the end of a sentence, I write LOL and it's completely sarcastic. Like this sarcastic. is a friendly like, tone. I'm talking in a friendly tone right now because yeah. I said LOL. It's either, it's either I'm talking in a friendly tone or... um. I want to die. Like I burnt my chips. Lol. <laughs> like I <laughs> like happy. ironically want to die. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, anyway, moving on. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should just start an internet linguistics podcast because I could talk about this for <laughs> We've hours. We've touched on so many things. This is a train wreck. I want to die. Lol. An um, interesting train wreck. Exactly. So yeah, we've already yeah yeah. So yeah. In all your in all your years of being on the internet, what has been your like the best fandom experience you've had? Like it can be a specific oh, wow. example or just like a culmination of a lot of things. Excuse me. Oh wow. I have no idea. I mean sometimes the things that start off as the best become the worst, like viral posts, for instance. Like I remember the first time one of my posts on Tumblr started getting lots of notes. Mm -hmm. um, I was in like, I was still in high school and um, I had just posted, that was just actually, it was just after photo sets were a brand new thing. Mm -hmm. And I posted a, a Tangled gift set of that scene in um, Mother Knows Best where they're lighting the candle and putting it out. And that just blew up and I was so shocked. And like the first time, if anyone's ever had a post go viral or like get a lot of notes for the first time, it feels so exciting because you're so used to seeing all these posts around with like 20,000 notes or a million notes. And you're like, man, what must it be like to have that? And, um, and then it happens. And when it starts off, you're just so excited. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it gets to a point where you just hate it. Like I made this <laughs> one post. I don't want to say I regret it, but I do want to say that um, the, um, the sexuality and gender issues portrayed in the post were being satirical and I am bisexual and I was when I made the post, but it was like this Mulan post of, um, am I gay? A journey of self-discovery with Shang, which I made at like 4am one night. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> just like, man, this is hilarious to me and like ironic. And, um, and that was really funny when I posted it. And now it's got like so many notes and it's been reposted on so many websites and it's the bane of my existence. <laughs> so like when that started, I was so excited. I was like, cool, people like this. This is so exciting. It's getting so much attention. That's, you know, really validating. And now I look back on it like, please stop reblogging that post. And then... But um. <laughs> What if yeah. like people listen to this and they're like, "Wait, that's the girl that did that." What? Yeah, I remember this. <laughs> that's definitely gonna happen to somebody. I mean, that tends to always happen at some point. I think that's. I wouldn't say that that's not my most popular post. Um, my most popular post is a high school music one, but that's the one that sort of reached the outskirts of the internet the most. I think because it was reposted on like Nine Gag and Facebook, and like it's spread sort of everywhere. Um. And there'll always be this point when I first start talking to someone online, if they've been in fandom for a while, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, the Mulan post, lol. And they'll be like, what? And I'll link them the post, and they'll be like, oh, this was you. And it's always such a weird, trippy moment. <laughs> but anyway, back to the actual question. Um, my best moment in fandom, I have no idea. Like, I think sometimes the things that are the most exciting at the time can go downhill after time. Mm -hmm. um, that's... Really well, maybe hard. maybe I'll make it more specific. What is your favorite yeah, okay, fandom okay. you've been a part of? Like, what has been the Ooh. funnest to be a part of, or the Ooh. least stressful? Just been a good a good experience. I think it often depends on how deep into it you are, like, um, or how much you explore outside your sort of circle of friends in the fandom. Because um, something can start off and you're like, I feel amazing. This is the nicest fandom. I'm having the best time. And then, um, you know, after a couple months, you start seeing all the crap and you just get brought down. But the, the, um, the best fandom, that's a, I've been through so many fandoms. I just like, I go through them very, very quickly. Um, back in the day, Teen Wolf 
was the best up until all the discourse started and that went downhill very quickly and could arguably be the worst now, which is interesting. But, um, you know, every, every fandom I've been in, it's like a, it's like a double-edged sword. Like there's the awesome side. Like I had so much fun getting deep into the Harry Potter fandom last year, like sort of revitalizing. Cause I've always been a fan of Harry Potter, but I'm um, not like a fan in italics for a good, like eight years. And then I got back into it last year and it felt like nostalgia, but modern fandom new, new experiences at the same time. And that felt so good. Um, but then at the same time, there are all these ridiculous, incorrect non-canon toxic opinions everywhere <laughs> because of, because of big blogs saying like this is a fact and everyone just goes yeah i haven't reread the books in seven years so it must be a fact and that'll drive you insane at this point i would probably say haiku is the because i haven't experienced a negative part of the haiku fandom yet because it's still sort of fresh to me um i'd say it's probably the the best fandom i've been a part of so far because i'm still in that like honeymoon phase and it's and it's so wonderful. Although there's something to be said for small fandoms, like um, um, small fandoms aren't going to have as much drama. Yeah. Like, I think me and like two friends on Tumblr cultivated the Spirited fandom entirely by ourselves because Spirited was an Australian TV show that um was not very popular because it was on um, like our version of cable, which no one not, isn't very popular. It was on like paid networks. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. At the moment, I would say Haikyuu because I'm still in the honeymoon phase. But I think uh, over time, when when there are as many people involved as they are on Tumblr and there are many different opinions around, eventually everything sort of goes downhill. Or you, or eventually you just sort of lose the rose-colored glasses. Mm-hmm. I mean, hmm. I've been in this... <laughs> hey, it's something that I know more about than you. That's a first. Hey, yeah, um, do it. <laughs> I've been in this fandom for two... No three no can i yeah three years now really wow um, yeah 2014 is when i joined the fandom yeah that's when the anime started right um so the the honeymoon phase goes away but thankfully that this fandom is so just oh. for some reason there is just not that much discourse or any yeah any that yeah. happens is so niche because the cast is so big like yeah. you have many fandoms within the Haiku fandom that are like I that really love true. this team or this team. Or yeah, there's so much there, which is this amazing. group of people in this team. For example, like the third years and the third gym uh participants. <laughs> so like <laughs> so Suki, beautiful. Kuro, and Bokuto. Um Wow, nobody's <laughs> some people might not even know what we're talking about right now. But Yeah, um, probably not. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I thought of an answer, by the way, to okay. to the um best fandom, um, because this is like because you were saying um you've been in Haiku for so long and um my most long standing fandom. I mean, okay, in terms of time and actual internet fandoms, Harry Potter would be it, considering that was my first, and then I was back into it last year. But okay, m emotionally, my most long standing fandom has got to be um Buffy, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, yeah. That even though. I, I always, even though I'll be like blogging about other stuff day and night, in my heart of hearts, I will always consider Buffy to be like my main fandom or like my number one because I've been a fan since I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, there's that nostalgia there. That it's always going to have a place in my heart. And um, there is, especially because people are rewatching it now as adults and sort of looking at it through a more critical lens, there is there is discourse, but um, not as much. And um. Yeah, that's got to be my favorite fandom just because I've got all that nostalgia. It's always gonna, it's gonna have a place in my heart. That that say. that is. There's my answer. <laughs> that, yeah, that's gonna be high cue for me in like five yeah, years, yeah. five ten years, I think because it's been really go so good for that, so long. Yeah, I'm hoping that high cue is gonna go into that area of fandom in like in my mind. It's gonna be one of those ones that I'll always have like a fondness for, even if I'm not active in it, like Buffy. Exactly. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, that I feel like I feel like that's a good place to to stop. It kind of went it okay. went down. We talked about the the negatives of being in a fandom, and then it kind of went back up at the end. Where we talk about how good it is to be to be in a fandom. But yeah, yeah, I thank you very very much for for lending your your insight into all of these very very important topics that we are talking about. Um, hmm. 
Yes, you did. Thank you you did fine. Me. I know you said you were nervous, but you did fine, <laughs> and people will it's, love it's you. It's very strange. I'm not usually very good at um, you know, talking with my mouth. I'm better at typing. <laughs> <laughs> better at eighty words per minute on your keyboard. <laughs> Yeah, a hundred yeah. actually, but thank you. <laughs> I mean, I guess everybody's diction tends to get better as they type, but you know, I have yeah. always preferred like verbal conversation because that's how I I've think. I've just always been terrible yeah. at them. I, you know, I stumble, I lose track of what I wanted to say, or you know, it comes out wrong. Yeah, exactly. But Speaking is hard, man. It's the Sorry? hardest part of a language. Speaking is the hardest yeah. part of a language. Yeah like speaking Absolutely. to another person a side note me learning german and being like a conversational speaker of german that is literally the hardest part of the language is having a conversation with somebody else because you know because you, you learn are, it so formally you're tran you're translating what they said and then you are trying to think of what to say in english and then translating oh, it yeah. to german and then trying to say that in the correct grammar it just takes a lot of thought process complete overload head. Yeah. Well, it's not an overload, but it just, like, it makes your sentences, like, they don't flow that well or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Speaking is hard, and no matter what language you, <laughs> you speak. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I like how we've managed to go off on another tangent just as you were trying to close the podcast. Exa exactly. I mean, it wouldn't be, <laughs> it wouldn't feel natural, you know? I think, you know, <laughs> I like podcasts where they just kind of flow to one thing's one thing to the next instead of like having a rigid kind of thing yeah yeah but that's absolutely. just always the podcast i've listened to is just like a free-flowing conversation which is what a podcast should be in my opinion so i don't actually listen to that many i mean me neither like i listen to like three <laughs> actually i haven't <laughs> well, listened to a something. podcast i haven't listened to a podcast since our vacation to florida in like two months ago so <laughs> Oh, I guess I listen. I listen to Funhouse's podcast pretty l regularly, but you know. Yeah, um, I I listened to Welcome to Night Vale back when that first became popular, mm -hmm. which is pretty. That's probably one of the most widespread podcasts I've heard of. Like everyone got into that for a while, but then like sort of nothing for ages. And now I'm listening to a podcast just in the last few weeks because um two YouTubers who I subscribe to, Lex and Rosiana, have just started this really fun uh friendships and relationships advice podcasts and that's sort of booted me back into the world of podcasts i think i want to listen to more because it, it's great because you can listen and um engage while you're doing stuff mm -hmm. whereas if you're watching something that sort of tends to take all your attention exactly but i'm like the kind of i'm the kind of person that likes to like be totally engaged with a conversation yeah like i feel like i don't like missing something and then like coming back Neither. to it and be yeah. like what are you talking about so I, that's I just hate how missing I stuff, but also my hands get so fidgety if I'm like not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I've got this app Dots on my phone, which is just this game where you connect the dots, and I'm pretty much always playing that if I'm watching something for too long. The good thing about anime, though, is that um I have to be always engaged because I'm reading subtitles. Subtitles, yeah. It's yeah, and it's really helped me sort of dial back my jitteriness. I can actually sit down and just like zone in instead of zone out you know exactly yeah that's the bane anyway. of, of dubs for me is that i'll zone out and just kind of listen to what they're saying instead of actually watching but yeah hey look good we're on about... another tangent i'm gonna cut this off before it completely <laughs> okay. derails okay thank you kiara for your your uh Thanks wonderfulness be. in being on and i think you added a lot to the conversation so yeah thank you thank you yes see you later <laughs> bye bye, bye. <laughs> Uh...